Kim Muir from Becky's Place. Thanks for joining me for the first video in my Basics of Colouring series. It's a four part series exploring the basics of colouring, skills, techniques and all the equipment that you use to colour. I've included a link in the description of the video for some downloadable resources for all four of the classes. You can head over to the blog and print those out um, whenever you like. I will be referring to those um, handouts throughout the class, but you don't need them to watch each of the videos. So today we're going to be talking about three basic groups of mediums. The first, pencils. These are uh, mediums that most of us are familiar with when we go to school. Then there's the water-based mediums. They cover things like um, distress markers, even children's uh, felt pens, children's markers. Um, watercolored paints, watercolored ink pads, pencils, and you can get a lot of um, ink pads that are water based as well. And the third family is the alcohol, oil, and solvent based medium. So we've got your stamp pads and your Copic pens, even your Sharpies, things like that. Um, all the things that have a base of alcohol, oils, or solvents. So let's get started first with the colored pencils. Now the core of a pencil is made from a mix of pigments, extenders and binding agents. The binding agents are usually uh, either wax or oil. So wax based pencils, which are Prismacolor, so I use Prismacolor pencils, they can be blended with baby oil, whereas oil based pencils such as um, Polychromos, they'll blend with an odorless mineral spirits. You probably notice a price difference in um, amongst a range of pencils. So when you're looking or shopping around for different pencils, you'll notice that there's quite a big price difference. That's usually due to the quality of the pigments, uh, how light fast they are, and the amount of extender that's in the pencil. Now, uh, watercolor pencils, although they come in the same form, they use a water-soluble binder, which allows the pigment to flow once water is added. And they belong in the water-based group of mediums. So we're not actually going to include these with your standard colored pencils. So one of the sheets in the downloadable resources is all about pencil control. And that's what I'm going to be speaking to you about now. I'll actually demonstrate what I have in this sheet just to show you. But this, you can use this um, for later on when you practice your own pencil um, use. Uh, and it's good to refer back to when um, you just want to know a few things about the pencils. So when using pencils, what we're looking at is uh, a variation in the amount of pigment that you lay down. So more pressure, if you start by adding lots of pressure, that means more intensity of the color. So the more I press, the darker that color is going to be, as you can see there. I'm just using plain smooth cardstock for this, nothing um, exceptional. The pencil will just go nicely over the top of this um, cardstock. So pressing harder, that means more pressure um, and more intensity of colour and less pressure means less pigment is going to be laid down and therefore you're going to get a lighter look to your colouring. What you want to do is to practice that transition between the high and the low intensity. So from going from all of this colour, what you want to practice is how much pressure that you're applying to your pencil and loosening that pressure slowly so that you get that transition between that dark color and barely being there at all. Okay, so that will work with any of your pencils. Softer pencils are generally a little bit easier. Um, the pigment lays down a little bit easier. But try with whatever that you have in your stash. If you're not very familiar with pencils, there's no need to run out and buy the most expensive um, set that you can. Just children's pencils from the grocery store also work. They're not quite as soft and um, the pigments aren't quite as clear but um, they will work and they're great to practice with as well so there's no reason you can't start um, with one of those. Alright so let's start with an example. I'll stamp a little flower and I'll give you an example of how you can use that pressure to colour your images. Now I'm going to show you why it's important to be able to go from those dark colors to transition to the lighter colors. So when we're coloring um, a flower with the petals, for example, you color one at a time, you want to get all the intensity of color down here at the base of each petal. So right here in the center. And that's going to give the impression that that area is further down inside the flower under the central part. So that's where we're going to apply most of our pressure. So if you start by coloring there, lots of color, lots of pigment. You see how much red I'm laying down? As you work your way out, you want to start to slowly lift that pencil 
so that you have that beautiful transition and that's how you're going to get a nice blend with your pencil so right out to the very edge now pencils um, have the uh, the quality of sitting on top of the paper so if you're not happy with how much of that intensity that you've added how much color you've got down you can come back and apply another layer or two and I might even just apply a little bit more intense color to the edges and then again feather it back in so releasing some of that pressure so that that color is a little bit lighter and you can do that all the way around now if you wanted to have um, some a fold or something inside the middle of the petal you can do that too in the same way so you'd apply that intense color that's down inside the fold bring it up and slowly release the pressure as you work your way up and then work sideways from that that fold releasing that pressure as you go now it's a lot easier to turn your work so if I was working without the camera I'd be well, I suppose I still can turn your work to make it easier for you to color so you can see how you get that nice blend just by releasing how much pressure you're applying on that pencil and that's why it's really important to practice these kinds of um, uh, exercises with your pencils do them over and over again until you can get that uh, that blend of color so that you are able to color the items that you want to um, in the way that you want to do it it's also important if you want to mix two colors together so if if I were coloring um, a multicolored flower probably not with purple but let me grab a yellow right. so if I wanted for instance a yellow center on my flower nice and intense color and then I'm going to fade out rather quickly about halfway along the petal till the color is almost gone and then if I want to bring the red in from this end this is where I apply the intensity of color and then work back towards that yellow lifting that pencil until the two colors meet and then we drag them together so we put one color over the other and you can come back with your, your yellow and work that blend until you can get a nice smooth transition between the two and again that's just with the application of pressure All right and this one this um, petal has a nice fold in it so we'll color that in a little bit and again smooth it out so that you don't have any sudden changes when you do have a sudden change like just here on the top of that petal it it looks clearly like a step down which is sometimes what you want so to show that that's a fold in the petal that's what we want all right, so being able to apply that very light amount of pressure is important for uh, smooth blending and transitioning between light and dark areas of an, in, of an image. Next up are our water-based mediums. Now water-based mediums are generally reactive with water, although there are some exceptions to that rule and even some items that are hybrids, but we're just going to keep to the basics for the sake of these videos. Water-based mediums work really well with watercolor paper because it's designed to hold a lot of liquid without damaging the fibers of the paper. Right, this is watercolor card and these are a variety of different watercolors. So I've got distress markers which are water-based. You can get the little uh, ink cubes of distress ink as well. But then a lot of other um, inks such as Memento, um, many of the uh, company brands, they're all water-based. They work just as well. Um, so do your cake watercolors so these are just a little um, tray of watercolor that you just spray with water or wet your brush and, and apply um, the water to this is an actual watercolor brush uh, it's made of squirrel hair and it holds it's designed to hold a lot of water so if I was painting a proper um, painting or something with watercolor I'd, I'd just use this brush when I'm paper crafting I tend to stick to the water brushes that have this this well here in the handle of water handy especially if you're going off to uh, classes or crop days or things like that so I'm going to show you directly onto the watercolor card and what I'm going to do is we're going to lay down a little bit of color onto uh, a non-porous surface in this case I'm using an acrylic block but you can use a piece of glass or if you've got a non-stick mat piece of plastic anything like that 
You can use any of these um, water-based products. So I can lay down a little bit of Distress Ink if I wanted to. I might use the pink so I could lay down my marker. Even the children's markers work really well. So it doesn't matter. Whatever water-based uh, products you want to use is fine. Then all you need to do is pick up the colour with your brush. So these water brushes have the water coming down through to the bristles. And then you apply it directly onto the paper. Now, watercolour is designed to follow water water when you apply it on the watercolor card so this color is designed to move along wherever there is water and that's how watercolor paintings work so if I was to color this is clean now if I was to color a splotch here of water and then add some pigment what will happen is that as that dries that color will continue to travel along the water until it's dry. So if I just apply a little bit more, pick up a little bit more, and it will continue to travel along the water until it's completely dry. When it reaches the edge of the water, it won't go any further. And that's how it's designed, okay? Now the other way to apply your color to your watercolor card is just directly. So you can actually add it directly to the watercolor card and then come in with your water brush and reactivate that color. It'll be a lot more intense where you've laid it down. Um, the distress markers are designed to remain reactive with water. So even if I went away for a long time and came back, that would still react with water because that's the way they're designed. You do have to be careful with that technique in particular because as you can see here, the, the pigments do stain the paper. So they will get into the paper and that's because as you're pressing them in, they go between the fibers of the paper. Alternatively, I showed you a bit earlier these watercolour pencils. They will do the same thing. So you can either apply them directly to the paper. So all I'm doing is colouring in and then using a little bit of water to activate that pigment. And you can see it does the same thing. So it's travelling along that water. This brush isn't giving me much water, but it will travel along that water. Okay, so if we're, we're talking now about a picture, if I were to have a flower, I'll just grab my other brush. If I was to draw a little flower with my watercolour pencil, for example, so if I had a petal, you could stamp your petal, obviously, if you wanted to. What you can do is just lay down a little bit of pigment. Don't worry too much about being tidy because that's going to become a water uh, paint when we apply just a little bit of water. So if I don't apply water in the center of that petal, then no color will actually end up in that center part. And that's how watercolor works. And when you're painting with the watercolors, wherever you want that intense color to be, that's where your brush should end up last. So pick it up down where there's the most intensity of color. And that, as I said, that will continue to travel along that water until it's completely dry. Now one of the things that we love about watercolour is how it can blend. It doesn't tr traditionally blend the same way that other, other colours do. So if you have a flower, it's a little bit more difficult to control watercolour because it follows the water. So if I were to have, if I wanted a red and yellow flower, so I've got my red pigment. This is what I showed you before, I have my little petals. So while that's wet, I can actually introduce another color if I want to. So I'm not going to add any yellow directly to the paper. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick it up directly onto my paintbrush, which is another way that you can add the color. So just grab your other, your other color and then use it like a cake of watercolor paint. So just pick it up directly onto the brush. So the brush now is all yellow and then I can tip it in wherever I want it to go. And that's going to mix by itself right there on the page. Again, remember it's going to follow the water and it will end up wherever it wants to end up. So you can see how it's slowly creeping outward following that water along the petal. And that's again, that's one of the uh, qualities of watercolor um, paints and things like that. The third group of coloring mediums are the products that contain oil, solvent or alcohol. Alcohol markers are one of the most popular mediums with colorists um, and there are lots of different brands on the market. Personally, I use Copic, but there are other brands and whatever you have at home is fine. 
So without turning this into uh, a demonstration on alcohol markers, I will just give you a little bit of a demo on blending tones within a single color family. Many of your alcohol markers will have uh, color codes on them. So with the Copic system, they all have a letter and numbers on the, on the marker itself. That tells you the color family. So in this case, it's B for blue. And then the number indicates how much of a tone is in each um, of the pigments. So you need to use them in, um, in like a color family, you don't have to follow the numbers on the markers themselves. But what we're looking for is that contrast between the lights and the darks. The easiest way to learn them is by using them in their number families and then explore and play with different variations of those colors. So I'm just going to grab some scrap paper because these markers tend to come through the page. So I'll just put that underneath to protect my work surface. And what I'm going to do is just show you how to demonstrate, or how to, I'm going to demonstrate how to blend the colors together, starting with um, a 91, which is a really light blue. Now I'm using blending card, which is specifically made for alcohol markers. So it allows the alcohol marker to move around on the cardstock. Everybody has their own technique for um, blending alcohol markers. So when you see other people do it, they'll do it a different way than I do, and that's fine. If you're happy with the results, then you're doing it correctly. So that was a 91, this was a 93, and I'm coming back in with a 91 and just blending where those two colors meet up. And then you basically go along getting darker and darker or lighter and lighter. Some people work from the darks to the lights, some people work the other way around. That's totally up to you. Whoops. And then you just work backwards and you blend those colors together until you're as dark or as light as you want to go. So basically it's just going over those transitions until you have a nice smooth blend. And again, you can blend two different colors together. These alcohol markers are designed for blending. So you should be able to blend um, the colors together nicely. Don't overwork the marker because what you'll find is that the pigment breaks up and then you end up with a, a sort of a mottly look to your work. So this is going all the way up to a 99, which is a really dark blue. And again, if we take the example of the flower that we've been using that whole time, so if I just draw a quick flower, I'll just use the lightest color here, the way we do um, the coloring for with the alcohol markers, we have our blending card, which allows those colors to blend. My technique is to color each part of the image with the lightest color initially. And then what I do is I switch to the darkest color. I don't tend to um, use a lot of the dark colors. I find that quite difficult. By the time I finish my picture, it's still very light. So I tend to start with the darkest color so I can make sure I'm getting enough of that dark in there. If you're the opposite way, if you find that your colors or your images are very dark after you're finished, it may be that you need to start with the lighter colors and work the other way. But I find that mine are always quite light, so I work the other way. Now I'm using little flicks of the pen and that those little flicks just help those colors to blend together. It gives sort of a rough edge where they can um, meld together a bit better. So I'm going through the colors and I'm working one over the top of the other so that they blend together until I get right back out to my lightest color. So you can see how those colors blend together. And then when I'm back at the 91, I can work backwards and go back over them. Now, you can do this multiple times until you're happy with the blend, until the blend is nice and smooth and you're happy with whatever it is that you get. So a lot of people do um, beautiful say skirts on, on um, images where they have all those ruffles and things like that, you do it in the same manner. So wherever the, the skirt crosses over, that's where it's going to be darkest. And that's where you'd apply that darkest color and then you'd work backwards with your other colors. So you'd be blending one over the top until you get right back down to the lightest color. So if this were a skirt and that's all your fabric, that's how you'd make those creases and, and um, folds and things like that. You'd keep working those colors together until it looked 
all nice and smooth. So you keep going with that until it was all nice and smooth. Okay, let's talk tool control, starting with dual tip markers. My Copic markers happen to have a brush tip and a chisel tip, which is what we're going to focus on. But if your markers at home have a different kind of tip, just spend some time practicing and playing around with whatever you have. It's a good idea to get as much practice as you can and to discover what different lines you can make by adding different sorts of pressures and by moving the marker around. Uh, I use the Copic markers, the sketch markers, which I said earlier, and one end has a brush tip and the other has a chisel tip. Now you'll find that your pens may have uh, a different sort of nib than mine, that's fine. Just practice with whatever you happen to have at home. Now what I mean by that is that you use your marker as a tool. So with the brush tip, you can do a number of things. It's not just for coloring in and blending. What you can do is hold it straight up and down on the point so that you can stipple, which are dots, so you can do big dots, small dots, all sorts of different sizes, which are little dots like this. And that stippling is great for if you want to color maybe the center of a flower or you want to add in some rocks and stones or sand or something like that. So whatever is has that nice textured look, that's how you achieve that with your brush markers. You can even use it to make a line of little dots. So more pressure means a larger dot, less pressure is a smaller dot. So you can get a, a string or a chain of dots in various sizes for decorative reasons. Um, you may like to put them, put the dots side by side uh, for a sort of a dotted border effect or whatever you want to achieve. So have a play with that so that you can get the, um, the variation in the shape and the size of those dots. Now line work is also something that's really useful with these brush tip markers. The lighter your pressure, the smaller, thinner line you're going to get. So as you press, the line gets a little bit thicker until you're applying sort of maximum pressure and that flexes the point. And that won't hurt it. Make sure you're dragging it away from you, not towards you, because that, that does do a little bit more damage. But if you vary the pressure that you apply on the line, you can get other interesting effects. So if I start light and then as I'm moving, I press, I'm going to get that lovely um, shape here. So press and then up again on the tip and you can create lines of of that sort of um, look. So varying the pressure as you you draw the line, that's handy if you wanted to colour in water, or even if you wanted to do say petals. So if I was doing a flower, I might start with a lot of pressure and then come up onto the tip and they make cute little petals. All right, so you turn your work as you went around and you can get some little petals. You might like to do scroll work. So um, again, this is varying the pressure that you're applying to the pen. So if you're into the sort of fancy scroll work, that's one way to do that. And you can play around again. You can you might add um, all those dots and things that we were doing earlier the, for the stippling. You can add those dots and create really beautiful um, borders and things like that just by altering the amount of pressure that you're applying to that, that end of the pen. Now with the chisel tip, it's a nice square tip. You can do more than just color in a large area. So it does have that large thick line that you can make. All you need to do to create other sorts of lines is turn your pen. So if I turn it sideways, I'm going to get a moderate line. And then if I hold it on the tip itself, I'm going to get a nice fine, even line. And that's handy for things like um, patterns. So if you wanted to create, um, say, a background with your markers, you might create a checkerboard pattern. Or one of my favorites is to create your own um, tartan paper just by altering the size of the tip. And you can change the colors up too. So you could add reds and greens and get a really nice Christmassy look just by changing the, uh, the heaviness of the line that you're drawing. Those of you who are extra creative with your lettering, and you have to forgive me for this, um, you can use the chisel tip to uh, do calligraphy. So I'm not very good at this, but those of you who are good at lettering, 
you might like to have a go at using it to do your lettering um, on the chisel tip. Let's now talk about the way the medium groups interact with each other, which is important for the end result of your colouring and also gives you a few more options for different effects in your piece of work. As we've seen from the blending of the alcohol markers and the mixing of the water-based groups, you can get some really nice blends and smooth transitions, which is, is very useful. There are drawbacks though from using the same colour family and that's things like smudging when you don't want that to occur. So if you plan to stamp an image and then you want to add colour later on, it's a good idea to use two different colour families. One medium to stamp and one medium from a different family to add the colour. The exception to that would be if you want to um, get rid of the line work, if you want that to be blended into your coloured image for a no line look. But we're going to keep things nice and simple and that will be something we can explore down the track. There's another form in the printable downloads about mixing and matching your mediums and it just talks about the different sorts of um, water based and oil alcohol solvent based products that you can use. I'm going to show you just a quick demonstration for those. So I have a sharpie pen which is permanent, I have some alcohol mark markers which are also permanent uh, and then I have a couple of water based mediums and some pencils. So I'm going to draw a couple of lines with the Sharpie marker and what I'm going to show you is this is in the oil solvent alcohol based family if I take I might use a yellow if I take a pen or a medium that's in the same color family which in case in this case the alcohol and the solvent or the oil are in the same family if I color over the top you can see how that smudges I don't know if you can see that properly, properly, but you can see how that yellow has gone very dirty. And that's because they're in the same colour family. Now, if I go over the top of the marker with uh, a colour that's in a different colour family, in this case it's a water-based colour, you're not going to get that smudging. So you see there's none of the marker has gone into that pink pen because they're different colour families. So you've got your oil, um, alcohol solvent base and your water base. Same with the coloured pencils. The coloured pencil is a, a different family again and you're not going to get that smudging because they're different colour families. If I were to do the same with, this is a water based um, pen, a fine line pen. If I were to do the same, so if I'm just going to scribble some water based pen down so you can see what I mean. Now if I were to bring in the, um, this might be still a bit dirty from using on the sharper, but this is the alcohol marker. If I were to bring the alcohol marker over the water-based colour, I've still got some Sharpie on that, but that generally doesn't move because they're two different colour families. However, if I bring the water-based colour over, you're going to get lots of movement of that colour because they're the same colour family. Let me just clean that off. But again, good old colour pencil, nothing happens. Coloured pencil is the exception to that rule. So if I were to draw with my coloured pencil in the same manner and bring over the other colour families, again, they won't run because they're not in the same colour family but you can even come over with a coloured pencil and it won't run either. So it's very versatile. Colour pencil is very versatile. But you can see from that demonstration how using um, mediums from the same colour family you're going to have that interaction. That's not always bad as we discussed. If you wanted to get rid of the lines when you're colouring then it's not a bad thing. But if you don't want to get rid of the lines and you don't want smudging, obviously you're going to have to go to a different colour family to get that non-reactiveness. So we've talked about the different mediums for colouring, but the other important ingredient is the surfaces that we're going to use. There are many types of paper out there on the market and they have different bases such as paper pulp or tree pulp, which we're all very familiar with. But you can also get papers made from bamboo, cotton and even synthetic papers such as Yupo paper. We're going to be focusing on three papers during this video series and that is the smooth cardstock which is quite common among uh, paper crafters. 
We're also going to use blending card and we're going to use some watercolor paper. And what we're going to do is play around and explore the different results that you get from each of those papers. Now it's really important to remember that there's no right or wrong when it comes to choosing the paper, just different results. Um, specific papers have been made for certain mediums, such as watercolour paper for water-based mediums. But you can still mix and match and just see what happens. That's the fun part of playing around with your colours. One of the other resources is uh, a little handout all about paper. And it shows you the medium and then the best surface for using that medium. So for instance, alcohol markers, I tend to use a blending card. They're also good with synthetic paper such as UPO paper or non-porous surfaces. So you can colour glass or buttons or plastic, things like that. So on that sheet, you'll find all that information. Now I said earlier that there is no right or wrong when it comes to choosing your paper, just different results. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that. So I'm going to use each of the mediums on the three different pieces of cardstock that I have just to show you that it, it can be done. Um, but you're just going to get different results. So I've got my alcohol markers here and I've got a water-based um, pen and a water brush that I've put somewhere, a water brush and some pencils. And then I've got the smooth cardstock, the blending card and the watercolour card. So first of all, let's start with the um, alcohol markers and they're designed specifically for the blending card, which I showed you up here. You can use them on other surfaces. So they will go down on your watercolour card, not a problem at all, they'll, they'll go down. I'm just going to use it gently though because the watercolour card is highly textured. It's designed to soak up lots of um, water and, and moisture and things like that. But it's really quite tough on, on your markers. So when you're using it, if you ever decide to use it on watercolour card, make sure you're aware that it's quite tough for your marker and it also sucks out a lot of the ink, which is ideally not something that you want to do. You don't want to lose all your ink on, onto a watercolour card. It will, however, blend. I have done it before. You are able to blend the colours together. Um, if you wanted to do that, you can blend on the watercolour card with your alcohol markers. Probably you wouldn't go from straight from a yellow to a red, but they do blend together and you can do it, but you do need to be aware that the watercolour card is very textured and will suck up a lot of the ink from your markers. Smooth cardstock, it also works well, but you won't get the ability to blend as well on your smooth cardstock as you do on your blending card. So although you can colour in um, sort of solid colours, the blending doesn't work quite as well as on your blending card. So you'll end up oftentimes, although it goes through on the blending card as well, it won't be that smooth transition that you get if you use your blending card, simply because it's not designed like the blending card is to do those smooth transitions, but you can do it. All right, so we can do the same now with the, let's use the watercolor. Again, same thing. So if I apply the, the uh, water-based marker straight down, and then add my water to it. You can see that it, it does react, but nowhere near as well as it did on the watercolor card. So you can see how that color traveled all the way along the water. Whereas when you're using just a smooth cardstock, the, the, the pigment from the pen soaks into those fibers almost immediately. And if you wanted to work it as much as you do on the watercolor card, you'd end up just damaging the fibers. Same as on the blending card. So it, it does go down, but again, it's not the same as when you're using um, the watercolour card. In fact, it's even less than on the smooth cardstock. You can see it barely moves at all because the, the blending card is not designed to soak up the water like the watercolour card is. Now, good old pencils. If you haven't noticed by now, these are definitely my favourite mediums because they go just about anywhere. The only place that I haven't seen them work well is on smooth cardstock. So this is, uh, not smooth cardstock, gloss cardstock. So this is your smooth cardstock and that's where I was demonstrating before. Also works well on watercolour card. And because pencil sits on top of the paper, you can see the beautiful texture of the paper that you're colouring. So with the watercolour card, because it does have a lot of those ups and downs, a lot of tooth, you can see all that texture. 
and then on your blending card very similar to your smooth cardstock so you can see that it goes down nicely so very versatile if you if you're trying to decide on what sort of mediums you want to invest in I highly recommend going with your pencils first well that's it for the first video in this video series I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit along the way video two will be about shaping images with color um, I hope you'll join me for that one in the meantime if you have any questions please feel free to send me an email or even visit me on Facebook I'm always around Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.